Hello, and welcome to the American Floral Endowment's three-part webinar series for Botrytis Research. Throughout this series, we will hear the latest findings from AFE's Thrips and Botrytis Research Fund. AFE is the national nonprofit organization that funds scientific research to identify and solve challenges within the floriculture industry. In 2021, AFE is celebrating 60 years of providing for the future of floral. In 2017, after listening to important industry feedback, AFE established a special research fund to aggressively address the control and management of thripsometritis. AFE's goal of reaching 1.5 million in pledges was met in 2019 with contributions from 24 industry leaders and organizations to support new and innovative research to address these challenges. With those funds, AFE has been able to support eight multi-year research projects to reduce losses and produce higher quality flowers and plants. The American Floral Endowment and all researchers would like to thank all of the organizations who have made contributions in support of this important initiative. Today's speaker is Dr. Jim Faust. Associate Professor of Floriculture Physiology at Clemson University. Today, on uh, part two of our three-part uh, Botrytis series. In part one, we talked about uh, some basic concepts um, that you may have been familiar with. Um, we talked a little bit about the biology of Botrytis, the, the, the fungus, uh, the symptomology, and, and talked about how to scout um, and some management strategies. Um, today, we're going to dig in quite a bit more deeply. Um, this is a, would be a much more advanced topic. Uh, I think most of the information you hear today, you probably will not hear anywhere else. I think this is um, some unique, uh, unique set of information that we've uh, have been developing over the last few years um, that can uh, help you to have a more effective botrytis management program by allowing you to have use fungicides that have um, 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 more efficacy and, um, and using them in such a manner that you don't build up resistance amongst your fungal spore population in your facilities. So my one data slide that I'm allowed in each of these presentations is, is, is simply to, to demonstrate uh, how fungal resistance uh, uh, or fungicide resistance is a, uh, a real thing. These are data that we collected from uh, uh, international rose shipments um, where we receive flowers, um, then we uh, put flowers in humid chambers, um, let any botrytis that was infected in those plants grow. We collected the spores and then tested for fungicide resistance amongst the, the spore population. And this slide simply shows you that across a lot of well-known and, and frequently used fungicides, there is a considerable amount of resistance out there. These numbers would will vary with every greenhouse, um, every different situation. So there's there's no, you know, these the numbers are not critical here. It's simply to show you that we can have a very high um, percentage of resistance in a fungal spore population. Um, and we can have resistance across many fungicides within the same spore population. So this is, this is the issue that we're having to address because there's no reason to apply fun fungicides if they're not going to work effectively. So the, what we'll talk about today will help you to avoid this situation. So, one of the, the first things to appreciate is that we have different kinds of fungicides and, and kind of can break them into two major classifications. And the first one being the single site fungicides and appreciating how these work um, is, is, a use, is useful when um, trying to make decisions on which ones to use and how to use them. So the single site fungicides are the fungicides that you are most familiar with the ones that you are using most commonly. These are the, the, um, the chemical names and of some that you would surely have in your facility and are using on a regular basis. We'll cover just a few of the characteristics um, 
that these entail. So one is that these uh, single site fungicides are used as in a preventative manner, meaning you could coat foliage uh, with, a, uh, with a spray application um, before a spore lands. You can also apply them after a spore has landed and germinated, and these will um, penetrate the plant tissue and, and inhibit the mycelial growth through that plant tissue. So the, these single site fungicides also, so therefore it's curative. So it's preventative and curative. So these single site fungicides also have a, a high degree of efficacy if there is no resistance. If you can have high level of resistance to these products, but if there is, if there is not resistance, they tend to be universally very good products. They have a high degree of efficacy. They um, are systemically, uh, um, will, they are locally systemic, meaning that they will penetrate tissue locally, um, not maybe long distance transport within a plant, but locally they'll, they'll penetrate. And, and they will inhibit the mycelial growth, which is the kind of the, the, the roots of the fungi that are penetrating um, the, the tissues. And, and they'll inhibit sporulation of, of, the, um, of that fungi. Another characteristic of single cell, single site fungicides is that their best efficacy is achieved when applied within 48 hours after infection. Infection meaning spore has landed, germ tube has come out, mycelia start to penetrate into the tissue. Um, so the, the more the mycelia has penetrated the tissue, the less effective we can expect these products to be. So ideally we get them on within 48 hours of there being a high probability uh, environment. So in field situations to do that, we try to time the application of these with rainfall because you're going, as I talked about in um, part one, the, <clears throat> the, the factors that influence the, the, the rate at which botrytis will infect tissue will be the temperature. Temp temperatures in the 60s, low 70s are quite ideal for botrytis to grow and the duration of leaf wetness. So if you have a, a long period of leaf wet wetness or flower wetness um, due to high humidity conditions, condensation or rainfall, these products will be more effective if we can get them applied soon after that high frequency or that high risk event has occurred. These products are also at medium to high risk of resistance development. And I'll discuss, I'll demonstrate how that is, why that is the case in, in the next slide. And it, it should be noted that once resistance occurs in the fungal spore population, um, that, um, that, that resistance can persist for multiple crops, multiple seasons, even multiple years. So it, the, if you stop using a, a fungicide because there is resistance in your spore population, uh, the eventually with these products, the efficacy of the product will come back, but it takes time because the spores that have resistance to these fungicides tend to be less fit than the naturally, naturally occurring spores. Therefore, the, if this left to their own devices and we don't spray any fungicides, the natural population tends to be more successful at living and growing and, and, and proliferating. Uh, so if we cease application of one of these products because of resistance development, um, that resistance development will tend to disappear over time, but it takes time. It, yeah. Ideally, we don't get the high level of resistance in the population in the first place. So single site fungicides basically are, will act on a single enzyme or some essential point in the pathway of the life cycle of that fungus. And so uh, again, these are the, the list of the products that, that you're familiar with. And so this is how I like to visualize it, to kind of simplify it. And so we have fungal growth and then we apply a fungicide, which is going to block that growth. But you know, the fungi are frequently mutating, they are adapting, they are changing. And, 
and so the, the, the enzyme that is targeted by these fungicides can be modified. And if that modification occurs in, the, in, in some of the, the, the fungal spores that are produced, then that spore will survive the fungicide application. And, and then that fungus continues to grow and, and, and the spores that develop from that fungus that has survived will have resistance and you will have fungal infection. So the reason why single site fungicides are so, sus so susceptible to resistance developing is because they are a single site of activity. There's one specific enzyme, for example, that they are acting on. And so it only takes one mutation or one modification of that fungus in order to bypass the efficacy of the fungicide. So that's a fairly easy thing to occur and because there's just this single site of action. And, and so that's why all these products are at a, at a moderate to high risk of uh, resistance forming because of the nature of the product. So uh, this is an example of the single site fungicides available in the United States. Um, I think this includes most everything that, that is on the market. Um, and, and so if you look, you know, we're, you're familiar probably with FRAC codes or the mode of action. Basically the, you know, you have a whole group of products here that have a similar um, FRAC code. And so there's more likely to have resistance develop within a FRAC code than from uh, going from one frac code to another. So when we're rotating fungicides, we're trying, we're really rotating frac classes. So if we look at this list, you know, it, it becomes pretty apparent. We don't have very many options when it comes down to it. You have this group of good products um, where there's medium risk to uh, resistance development. This would be the frac sevens and the, Efficacy does vary mostly, it's pretty high. Boscolid, we tend to see a little less efficacy than we have seen in the past because it's perhaps of this group has been around the longest and has been used the most. Um, so we have FRAC class seven, we have FRAC class 12, and these are a couple products that may be mixed with additional products that don't provide like Suprodinol, don't provide a lot of uh, additional benefit for um, botrytis control. Um, so we have a second frac, we have sevens, we have twelves, we have frac 19, which is uh, uh, polyoxin D compounds. And these are uh, also uh, can be effective. And, and then we have ones that where there's a, a bit more resistance we see out there. So drawing this one in yellow, uh, because, the, because of uh, more resistance, we're seeing less efficacy these days of uh, things like decree. Uh, FRAC 17. And then Chipco, a very old product, or Iprodione, uh, has a very low e efficacy due to the high resistance that's out there. And then Thiophan A-methyl, um, we mostly don't even bother with for botrytis control anymore because internationally, uh, there's um, everybody has a high level of resistance of this product, so it has very little efficacy. So when you're looking at botrytis fungicides, single site products, these are our best options, but there aren't many of them. And this underscores how important it is for us to manage resistance so that we keep these products being effective as long as possible. Some of the characteristics of multi-site fungicides are that they are broad spectrum. These are products, if you look on the list over here, are names that have been around for a long time. Um, there are older products. Um, the ones in parentheses have been removed from the, with, they don't have greenhouse ornamental labels anymore. They are used in some other um, industries, um, but they're the names that you probably are familiar with if you've been growing for uh, several decades. These tend to be older technologies. Because they are broad spectrum, they, they affect non-target organisms. And so, and we're trying to get away from that sort of product uh, using it in agriculture in general, because uh, we don't we want to specifically address apply products that work for specific problems and not kill non-target organisms. So we don't really like to use these as as as, as much as 
but we try not to use them as much as possible in especially outdoor situations in greenhouses i think it's less of an issue but outdoors certainly is an issue um these are preventative products they are protectants they are not curative so if you spray them after a spore has germinated and started to uh, infiltrate plant tissue they're not going to work they tend to act on spore germination in the early stages of uh, fungal infection so they're protectants and prevented they're used for preventative not curative they also in general don't have the high level of efficacy or the potential efficacy as the single site products. So they don't quite work as well. Um, they don't penetrate tissues, so they stay on the surface. They kill spores by contact, um, prevent spore germination. As a result, the application technique is even more important because you don't get this local systemic uh, movement of the product in through tissue. It doesn't penetrate the tissue. And so you have to have a lot of small droplets uh, landing on the tissue to protect it well, um, to because it really has to come in contact with the spores. And so the spores are landing on tissue that has this product on it. The, so none of these things are real positive, but the, 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 the good part about multi-site fungicides is that there is low risk of resistance development. And the reason is there are multiple sites that, that the fungicide acts on. So some of it's the problems with it are actually the benefit um, in terms of disease resistance management. So in this same example, we have the fung fungal growth. We have you know, some physiological adaptation occurs in that fungus to allow it to uh, overcome the first site of action of the fungicide. The problem is, or the benefit, or the good thing is, I guess maybe is that since these are multiple sites, you have another site of activity. And so the, the likelihood of a spore being simultaneously developing two different adaptations to get around two different um, sites of action is very, very rare or, or low, likely, low likelihood of occurring. And so we don't often see um, resistance to these products. Um, amongst the spore populations of Botrytis. Um, so we don't see fungicide resistance so much with these guys because of the way they work, because they have multiple sites. And so these two groups of fungicides, we rely on them and we use them differently um, because they, they act differently. And, and we use them to manage uh, uh, resistance of the single site products uh, differently. So, just wanted to bring to your attention that there's a, a FRAC website that has a lot of really good up-to-date information if you want um, real details about uh, resistance, um, 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 efficacy. This, you know, it's a keeps up-to-date with showing you the current risk of, um, in the real world um, usage of these uh, different FRAC classes. And, and so this is a, this a, something that is a good resource for you if you uh, want to dig deep into this subject. So you have resistant spores in your greenhouse. Where do they come from? It depends on a, a couple of factors. One is that if you're growing long-term crops, like you have a plant in the greenhouse, something like a cut flower rose, where it's in there for multiple years, then the resistance that you have in your botrytis spore population, the fungicide resistant, is going to be have to depended on what fungicides you've been applying over the recent months and years. So you've developed your own unique um, spore population in these long-term crops. For growers that are growing shorter term crops like bedding plants, potted plants, or even cut flowers that are uh, annual crops, or they come out, um, uh, you know, it's a 10, 12 week crop like a mom and then you pull it out. Um, these, you are, uh, you do have, when you, with your fungicide applications, you will develop resistance within your greenhouse, but you also need to be aware of when you bring in young plant material from other facilities, you're bringing in spores that have resistance profiles based on what fungicides the uh, young plant producer has been using. Um, so when you're bringing in cuttings, for example, or any sort of young transplants, um, um, 
you will be bringing in spores from a different facility that will have a different um, uh, resistance profile. Um, they'll be resistant to different fungicides than perhaps what you're using. So uh, it's just something to be aware of. So what you, what, what you can do is develop a fungicides resistant, resistance profile of the spores in your greenhouse. This is just a hypothetical example that I brought up. So the, 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 the resistance data here are meaningless. I just put in something. Um, but you can develop this sort of information for your facility with the idea of identifying which fungicides are the ones I need to be using, which ones am I wasting my time because there is resistance in my greenhouse. And now, because in the US, um, there, there's not a lot of opportunity for you to send lab samples some, or spore samples to somebody to a lab to um, do this for you. You can actually develop your own lab and develop it yourself. In Colombia and South America, um, there are actually commercial labs that will do this resistance testing for you. And uh, a lot of the larger cut flower growers have developed their own techniques um, and their own labs in order to just to do this in-house because it's such an important issue. Um, they, they've built their own lab facilities to do these tests. So I will show you how, how this is done. But ultimately what we're trying to do here is identify um, with the spores that are in our greenhouse, whether we have low, medium or high resistance to these individual fungicides so that it helps us to put together a fungicide program. So I'm gonna show you a video here that uh, Melissa has put together um, that kind of walks you through the first of three techniques that you can use. This is the more, I'd say the more challenging technique, a little more sophisticated. Um, and I'll show you two that are simpler, um, but this is how you can um, identify resistance in your facility. So, that's, oops, that did not go. Well, in the practice runs, it has worked beautifully. Uh, well, I will just describe it then. So what you do is that you, this is what we would call lab assay with cultured media amended with fungicides. So what you're trying to do is um, uh, you would um, take samples of tissue. Uh, so for example, put rows into a uh, humid chamber, let spores uh, develop, and then you can pick off those spores with a toothpick and simply, and then take those spores and put them in little um, vials that have uh, media in them and the fungicide in them. And so then after three days, you can come in and look at those vials the, and little template of vials, and you can identify where the spores have grown and where they have, there's been no growth. If the spore has grown on a media that has a fungicide in it, that means that spore is resistant to that fungicide. If there's no growth, that means the fungicide is effective. And so if you take enough samples in this, example, we're, we're suggesting that you do 12 isolates. So you do uh, 12 samples and, and then you could calculate a percentage of those samples, um, those spores from your greenhouse that are resistant to each of the fungicides that you're interested in. So um, it's fairly, actually it doesn't take very long because you can evaluate uh, this after um, four to five days. So I'm gonna just try this one more time, see if it will pop up. And no luck, so we'll just go to the next slide. Okay, the lab essay, the test number two is, is, is a simpler process because in the first process you have to, you know, um, put in fungicides at different concentrations into these little plates. Um, in this example, what you do is we can test for uh, how effective a fungicide is for preventing 
uh, botrytis or for curing botrytis. And so the two ways we do that is simply taking a Petri dish, take your, your sensitive tissue. In this example, we're showing you rose petals, put that, put the tissue in there. We can spray the fungicide on the petals and then come in and spray the, um, a solution of spores, botrytis spores that we have collected and grown. So that's the hardest part of this. So you have to collect some spores, you have to grow them in some media. It's really not too difficult, but then you take those spores, you put them into a solution so that you can spray them onto the, the petals. So we've treated the petals with the fungicide, then we've come in with a, a spore um, um, population that we spray on and, and we see how effective that product is, that fungicide is, for preventing that, those spores from growing. You can also, so that's a, a preventative application. We can kind of reverse the order of our application so that we can spray the spores on unprotected tissue and then spray the fungicide on 24 hours later and see if a spore that has germinated and starting to grow will be inhibited in its growth or, and controlled by a fungicide application made after the spore is germinated. So we get into an idea of how effective the fungicide is behaving in terms of preventing or curing a botrytis infection. So it simply takes some Petri dishes, some moistened filter paper, um, and, and a few days uh, for sporulation to occur. The most difficult part of this process is, is you know, having to isolate spores, grow them in some um, media, again, on a Petri dish and then uh, mix, mix up a solution of the spores, or they call it a, a suspension and spray it on the tissue. So it's really not a complicated lab procedure um, that, that can be done in-house. And there are growers that do, do this regularly in their facilities um, to evaluate uh, what products are working for them. And it's very interesting to track these things over time by repeating the process on a three or six month basis and, and, and uh, and, and, and uh, so you can almost uh, watch if you're getting more and more resistance to a product uh, appear up over time. Our third uh, type of test that we can do is a greenhouse assay, where again, we put a cultured media, we put some, uh, a solution into a Petri dish that allows fungi to grow quite well on that, on that media. And we put, the petri dish with the, the cap off of it into the greenhouse for just two to four hours. And so during that time, spores of various species of fungi are going to land on that dish. Then you bring the dish in, um, put the cap back on, seal it, wait a few days, to observe the fungal growth in that dish. Now you're going to get more than botrytis, um, but, and I, I failed to mention what you would also put in this media would be different fungicides. So you can prepare petri dishes with different fungicides in them. And, and again, if the fungi grows on that media with the fungicide, that's an indication of resistance. So again, it's mixing up the Petri dish with the media and the fungicide it takes a little bit of effort, but it's not a complicated lab procedure that one can do. It does take a bit of a trained eye to differentiate different fungi, but it's not that difficult. Uh, with a little bit of practice, it's quite easy to you know, differentiate different species of, of fungi. So this again, a, a way for you, relatively low cost, relatively easy um, way of evaluating fungicide resistance specifically in your facility. So how would we interpret these results? Well, the first thing we need to appreciate is that the results are simply a snapshot in time. The results don't, are not necessarily gonna be meaningful months down the road, um, but it, so it's, it's kind of like doing pH and EC testing with um, your plant nutrition program. You just don't do it once on a crop. You're kind of doing this as a continual basis as a way of monitoring um, your fungicide resistance in your facility. And this information is going to be most useful in allowing you to choose what fungicides are going to be your very best products during the very most important times of the year. So you are reserving your best single site fungicides for the peak season when botrytis is going to be, um, or by the botrytis, cruel, botrytis control is going to be most critical. 
And the way we would analyze the, the data on these, if you have you know, 12 samples, for example, for each fungicide, um, 12 different spores that we uh, tested, if we have less than 25% of the, the vials or the, the petri dishes developing um, where the botrytis grows, then we would indicate, we'd suggest this is a low resistance situation and that a single site fungicide will be very effective on its own. If you have 25 to 50% of the isolates that you have tested are showing resistance, then we call, classify this as moderate. And in this situation, we would not recommend you using that single site fungicide by itself because of its lower degree of efficacy. Well, it's, it has some efficacy, but there's a fair enough, uh, there's a fair amount of resistance in your botrytis population. So we'd recommend that you actually add, do a tank mix of this single site fungicide with a multi-site product, multi-site fungicide product. If you have more than 50% of the isolates showing resistance, then um, the fungicide use would not be recommended and you would not return to using that fungicide until months, years down the road, it has regained efficacy. So we'll, we'll leave you with uh, seven suggestions on fungicide management resistance, resistance management. As we talked about in the first lecture, uh, early detection is, is key to prevention. Um, sanitation is key, meaning you're scouting and preventing tissues from sporulating in your production facility. Uh, reducing the spore population goes a long way. Um, if you have a huge spore population, you know, there's only so much fungicides can do. Applying the correct doses of the fungicides and within a proper time frame of when the spores are most likely to have germinated. Obviously, we have to rotate our frat codes. And, and then we need to consider tank mixing when we have single site products that are losing their efficacy, where they only have uh, more of a moderate uh, level of uh, uh, efficacy or there's moderate resistance to them amongst your sport population. The sixth one is our, one of our current research topics being supported by the AFE funding, and that is looking at non-fungicide disease management strategies to use during periods of low and moderate risk. The idea is that if we can reserve our very effective single site products to the most critical times of the year, then when we really need them, they will be effective. That means during the lower risk times of year or times of a crop, if we can rely on other products that may not be as effective as um, a single site fungicide, but they do have some efficacy. And so they allow us to um, have a, a more, a longer fallow period, a longer period where we don't, where we're not applying a single site fungicide. And so um, we're not building up resistance. So this is a tool that we can use to um, uh, reduce the amount of resistance in our greenhouse population. And so what we're talking about here would be using some biological products, some of the beneficial bacteria, uh, some of the beneficial fungi that are out there. These are just examples of some commercial products that currently exist. We're also, and so we're testing these and we're also, um, uh, looking at some products that are not currently available in the market. Uh, there are systemic acquired resistance products like ActiGuard, where it Im improves the host uh, tissue resistance to uh, infection. And then we'll talk about more in our last installment is the use of calcium um, as, a, as a protectant of plant tissue. And then we've seen some very nice results with that. We'll go into detail uh, next, uh, next week. And then our last um, management uh, suggestion would be the proposed the idea that you reserve an effective frac code for post-harvest applications. The, 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 to show you how that would work, the green here represents you know just a period of greenhouse production. And let's say we're rotating our frac codes, so we've applied a frac seven and a frac seventeen, followed by a frac nineteen, and then we've come back in. Next time we need to apply a fungicide, we, we've chosen the FRAC 7 and then 17 and 19. So we're rotating our FRAC codes as we know we need to do. 
But we have, and we only have, remember from previous slide, we really only have five frac codes that are of much use with for botrytis. But we reserve one of those frac codes purely for post-harvest application, meaning right before a plant is to be shipped or maybe even in the post-harvest environment, we're treating those plants with a, a frac code that we've never used in the greenhouse. And therefore we should have a very high uh, efficacy, very low resistance. And then we don't build up resistance in our greenhouse because those plants are immediately being shipped and going out the door. And so if they if there is some resistance build or occur in the botrytis that may be on those plants, the sporulation is gonna occur someplace else, you know, in a, in a retail environment, for example. And, and so this product will stay effective for a very long time and, and therefore really control um, botrytis, at least in a post-harvest situation, which is often when botrytis is, 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 botrytis control is most critical. So this is a strategy that um, is, is one that I think is worth considering. 